You're welcome to ask any questions at any time. Just gonna say talk. Hey, just like the brother said, my name is Maria del Pilar Chavez de Felix. Um, I'm originally from Colombia, South America. So it's a little bit more south from Mexico. I've been doing uh, Mexico research for the past 13 years. And my husband is a native from Arizona, but his parents are from Mexico. And I have the uh, great privilege of doing research uh, through his line. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit with the uh, history of Mexico. Mexico has a um, very long, long history. So I'm going to kind of, we don't have that much time to cover the whole uh, history of Mexico. But uh, the first thing, uh, Mexico, the full name is Estados Unidos Mexicanos, United States of Mexico. And Mexico has 31 states and one federal district, just like United States, and Mexico City is the uh, federal district. Now, uh, what do you know about your ancestors uh, in, in Mexico City or in, in Mexico? Now, Mexico, as I said, has 31 states. Uh, the north part and the central and south of, uh, south of Mexico, they can all be divided in different countries. They are full of uh, uh, culture. Um, the people are totally different depending on the states. Uh, the cuisine, the food is totally different. I love Mexican food, especially from um, Zacatecas. I had the privilege of going there with my husband and, and my kids in 2006. Um, the flag from Mexico is very similar to the flag from Italy, but it's the opposite. Can you hear me? Okay. The green represents uh, the hope of the nation of the peace from the people of Mexico. The white represents the peace. Uh, the red represents the blood that was shed for the nation of Mexico. The eagle represents the people from Mexico. And the serpent right there in the middle represents the enemies. So the serpent, I mean, uh, the eagle is eating the serpent, so meaning that the people are striving to get their enemies out. Mexico, just like the United States, is a melting pot. As you can see, there is people from all over the place. As I was saying, Mexico is rich in history. Uh, I don't know if a lot of you guys are familiar with uh, Hernán Cortés, Spaniard that came to Mexico in 1519. And he was uh, a man who wanted to conquer Mexico, and he did. Uh, between 1920 and, uh, 1520 and 1521, Montezuma dies. He's the last emperor of Mexico. In 1571, the city of Mexico is established. Okay, the history of Mexico uh, also continued in 1910. And I did a lot of study during this time because uh, my husband's ancestors, um, a lot of them fought during the revolution. Uh, so many of the people who were in the north part of Mexico immigrated to the United States. And a lot of people who were in the south of Me Mexico, they immigrated to the north part of Mexico. Uh, by 1820, um, about 12 million Spaniards immigrated to Mexico, Central, and South America. In the early 1900s, uh, people from China immigrated uh, to Mexico, too. I was reading about a little bit of that of the Chinese, and, and it's very interesting because uh, the state of Sonora is full of uh, Chinese, which I was surprised when I was doing research for my husband's line when I found them. Also, um, in the state of Chihuahua, um, there's um, settlements of LDS uh, colonies there. Uh, I was surprised about that, too. I didn't know that. So uh, about 1895, there was a movement of um, LDS um, members that settled in the states of Chihuahua, Sonora, and Durango. But now, only Colonia Juarez, Colonia Dublan, and Casas Grandes are the only remain active uh, settlements there. And there is a temple that was built in 1999. 
uh, in Colonia Juarez. Uh, so in it's the smallest temple in, in Mexico and also here in the United States. And I'm going to show you just a little picture of the little town there. Also, there is a lot of Jews in Mexico. That was very surprising when I, I also found about that. And they, um, they're very strong, especially in the city of Mexico. Uh, a lot of folks that might have uh, or might be searching for um, ancestors. Uh, Mexico City has a lot of uh, population Jews in, in Mexico. Okay, the Mennonites, or Mennonitas, the way they are called in Mexico. There are a group of people who come from Russia. And they are very um, interested people. They, their type of work that they do is farming. They came about 100 years ago to Mexico. And they settled in the states of Chihuahua, Durango, San Luis Potosí, Sinaloa, Sonora, Zacatecas, mostly in the old uh, north parts of Mexico, and in the south, Quintana Roo, and Campeche. But now, due to the um, um, cartels in the north part of Mexico, there's a lot of contention, so a lot of the uh, Mennonites are moving towards the south part of Mexico in what is called Quintana Roo, Oaxaca, and also Tabasco. And the south part of Mexico, the climate is a little bit uh, better for their farming, so uh, they're moving there. Something that I found very interesting is that uh, next year they will have the opportunity to go back to Russia. But the, the government there told them that the only way that they, can, that they are allowed to come back is if the men go back to, uh, to the army, to join the army. So um, I don't think a lot of them are too happy about that, so they're still going to stay in Mexico. OK, now um, this lady here and this man here are my husband's grandparents. Uh, they also, there is a lot of migration from the south states of Mexico. To, um, to the north part. So in 1910 and all the way to the 1920s, due, uh, due to the um, revolution in Mexico, a lot of people were fleeing from the southern states of Mexico towards the north. So the lady here, she was from Aguascalientes, and she moved to Puebla, Mexico, when she was five years old. And Santiago, the gentleman here, he was from Zacatecas. And he was about seven years old when he moved. And they ended up meeting in Puebla when they were a little bit older. And as you can see, his, his, oh, he was very white, blue eyes. She's a little bit darker. Another thing that I found very interesting about migration was the uh, Bracero program that was between 1942 and 1964 during the uh, World War II. There were not enough men here uh, in the states of California and Texas. Uh, to do the uh, farm uh, labor. So uh, the government uh, decided to um, do this program to hire uh, men from Mexico. And they had to be very healthy in, um, in order to come and, and, and work here in, in the States. Um, a lot of them had a, a little car, as you can see here. It was like a permit for them only to work for a certain time. Once that permit got expired, uh, they were allowed to go back to Mexico. Uh, so a lot of people now, they're looking for their um, parents or grandparents. Only the males were allowed to come and do this labor. So they're looking back uh, to see if their parents were um, part of the Rosero program, because now they're eligible to get some grants. So um, they're looking now for those um, uh, identification cards that they granted. OK, what information do we have about your ancestors? Um, many times we might be having treasures in our home. Many times we don't. Uh, my husband was serving a mission in Mexico in the states of um, Zacatecas, Durango, Aguascalientes, and Coahuila. And he knew that uh, his grandfather, the gentleman that you guys saw just previously, um, he was from Zacatecas. So while he was serving there, uh, he went and looked for his birth certificate, which is the one here on the uh, right-hand right side. And because of that birth certificate, we were able to, to find more, more of his ancestors. 
actually the, the original um, is different. But uh, the priest there, they usually now you pay a, a little fee and they all type the uh, certificate. Oh, okay, they asked me if it, this is the original certificate. Okay, um, also we might have pictures that in the back usually people used to write information of who was in, in the pictures. For instance, here is my husband's uh, grandparents, Santiago and Maria Jesus. This is the lady there with the uh, polka dot dress. There is a wedding, and up to this day, we still don't know whose wedding is it. So we don't know if we're, they're related to, to my husband. Another thing that I found very interesting is the letters. Um, many times, people used to write letters to family members when they were either away from home in the States. And many times, they used to say, so-and-so passed away, somebody had a baby. So it's very interesting for us to, to go back and read those letters. I have the... Um, the privilege of having my grandmother's letters up to this day, it's very hard for me to read them because the way she wrote, and I'm still reading them and finding a lot of information in letters. Yeah, another way we can find more information is through newspapers. And this one, um, on the right hand side, the gentleman in the wheelchair is my husband, great great uncle. Um, I guess. They were donating a uh, wheelchair, so that was another way we can we were able to find information that he was alive in in the 80s, 1980s. This might be a little bit creepy, but another way to find more information is to to go to the cemeteries. Um, while we were in Coahuila, Mexico, we went to the cemetery and we were able to find more of the relatives from my husband there in the cemetery. So we took pictures of the um, actually um, places where his ancestors were buried. Now this is my my um, how can I say the the best part that I like talking to to the oldest person in the family. Many times as um, we might have a grandparent or an aunt or uncle, we just don't want to spend time with them. Um, the lady that I showed you guys earlier, um, in 1987, when we first got married with my husband, I had a little bit of time spending time talking to her. And it's very interesting, the stories, everything that they got to say for, you know, for us children. So, um, so that's another way to find more information, talking to the oldest relative in the family. And here she is. Um, as I was telling you, in, in 1987, I sat down with her. And my first question to her was, how many children did you have? And she said, I had 17 children. And I went, what? She only said, I only had 17. She had 16 boys and one girl. So I was like, whoa. <laughs> but you know, for them at that time, it was like nothing. Another shocking surprise was that she was married when she was 14. And he was 17. So um, back then, it was normal for girls to, to be married at age 14. Uh, and then the gentleman next to her is uh, her brother-in-law. Um, he's from Zacatecas. Okay, Where can we find more information? Um, in us doing research, when we were looking for information from my husband, we went down to Mexico. Now, I would not advise you guys to go to Mexico right now. It's, it's not good to go right now, but um, maybe in the future. The border lines right now, they're OK, but um, because of the uh, cartels war that they're having, it's very unsettled to visit Mexico right now. Another place that we can find more information that we can visit is the uh, Mesa Family Search Library. There we can find uh, many other uh, sites that we can find information in order to find more ancestors in, from Mexico. Okay, once we go to the uh, um, Mesa library, we can um, go to a computer and ask for help, or if we have a computer at home, we can do it too. But there we, um, in the computers, we have this, this side where we can um, see there's a lot of places that we can find more information. My favorite one is the uh, Mexican census from 1930, and that's the fifth um, census that it was done in Mexico. 
The other place that I like to go to to find a little bit more information is the website by topic and place international. It's another place that we can find more information. When you go in there, you can click on, on Mexico and it will give you uh, a lot of places in Mexico where you can find more research. Um, I went in there and you can go actually to the cemeteries. There's only two states, I believe it's Chihuahua and Sonora, the only uh, two cemeteries that has pictures from the actual place and the names of the people that are buried in Mexico. Okay, here's a picture of the census records when you go to the um, family, um, to the Mesa family uh, search library, you can go to the uh, uh, Mexico census from 1930. As you can see here in the top, the Mexico national census from 1930, and you click the state, state of Chihuahua, the town, Coahuila, and the little, little place called Colonia Gardia or Gardia. Now, a lot of these places don't have the same name that they have nowadays. They have changed a lot of the town names, so you need to do a little bit more research there for the names. Uh, this is the front page of the census. And what I notice is that uh, the person usually taking the census is somebody in the town. Um, it's not like a paid worker, but it's somebody from the town. And you usually will see his name on the left-hand side, right there. And here in the bottom, it will say the number of the place where he's taking the, uh, the census from. So for instance, it's block 49 to 50, 51, 52, and 59. That's the block that he's doing the census. And on the right-hand side, it will say the city or the town and the facility right there. And name again of the little place. Oh, sometimes it might be a ranch. And if, for instance, this, this person here wrote Pueblo, which means town, and they cross it out and put a colony, meaning that it's smaller than, than a Pueblo. Now, this one right here, um, when I was looking for my husband's um, ancestors, I found his great-great-uncle, Bonifacio Felix. And as you notice, um, right here, where it says place of uh, birth, it comes from Zacatecas. There's a lot of writing on the, um, on the census, which is a little bit confusing to understand. Uh, the first two lines, right here to my left, is the name of the street where the houses are. The number right here, the 126, is the number of the house. Let's see, where's my marker? The X means the uh, head of the house right there. So for instance, the first one right here, Bonifacio, uh, he's the father, or it could be also the older, uh, the older person living in the house. But in this, in this house, for instance, is um, two brothers and a sister living in the house. Also on, let's see where's my marker right there. Right here, the first line where you see the X, it will say if either is uh, a male or female in the age. The second column right here, which says um, Estado Civil, or Civil, meaning if they are single, if they are married, uh, living in, they call it uh, like living together, but they're not married. Um, if they're widow, still in the second column. Let me see if I can see that a little bit better. And the third column right here, it will specify what type of job they, the person does. For instance, this one is a farmer. Now, if the person is from another state, like for instance, the one that I found from China, usually it will say the, the country here, and it will say um, what part of China in the language that he also speaks. So sometimes they will put Chinese and Spanish. The last one here, what type of religion did the person exercise? So Catholic and this one right here, oh, sorry. If you see it like that X right there is marked, that means that the person who took the, um, the census made an error, and whoever came and checked the census, they, they mark it off. Okay, the next page from the census is the back of the page. 
And it's usually the instructions for the person who's taking the uh, census. And it's the same thing as the uh, from, from the page from the other side. And this is what would you see when you uh, be looking at the census, the whole page. As you can see, this one is, um, you're able to read it, but there are some that you have, will have a hard time reading because either the person who's taking the census might be the only person that knows how to write and he doesn't write very well. And sometimes the census is very hard to write too. Now when we're looking at census records, we got to be very careful. When I was looking at the uh, Chinese records, uh, for instance, a lot of the uh, Chinese have Spanish names, but they're from China. So that means that a lot of people took over other names, but not, they were not given the original, the original name. Um, also, uh, the Mennonites will give Spanish names. For instance, the father or the great-grandfather will not give the original name. They, they took over Spanish names. Um, I found one from uh, Sonora, a gentleman from the States, from the United States, and he married a lady from uh, Sonora. He also took on Spanish name, so we have to be careful there too that sometimes they might change their names, and so you might be looking for a different name and then you find something else. Um, here too with the age, you got to be very careful too. I found that yesterday, there was um, a couple. He was 25, she was 20, and they had a 14-year-old daughter. So meaning that whoever took the census, they wrote the, the, uh, the age of the daughter wrong. So sometimes we got to kind of check for the dates, names, and all that. Okay, my favorite website, the uh, familysearch.org. As you can see, this one is Spanish. Um, the English version, you can go all the way in the bottom and click. Uh, where it says uh, language, and it will give you the Spanish one. This is for my Spanish speakers. They've been asking me how we get the, uh, the, the Spanish site. Um, when you get to the uh, Family History Center or at your house, you can click on familysearch.org. And you need to have, um, um, I'm thinking in Spanish, an ID and password in order to, to get in into the family search.org. And this is a free site you don't have to pay for. Um, and this is the, the best place to, to find more information. Now, when you get to um, the family search.org, there's a question. Is there um, more? OK, repeat it again. Are there other census besides 1930? OK, if there's other census besides the 1930, no, this is the only census that we have online, the 1930 so far. There is four more, but this is the only one that we have available online. OK, mm -hmm. this is the collection that the uh, familysearch.org has so far. Uh, so far, every state has um, has been indexed, so we'll be able to find information from um, any state, and also the uh, census from 1930 is under the uh, family search. Now, there is a lot of um, information still um, not reported under the uh, familysearch.org, and we still have to go to the um, uh, Mesa Library and, and get films in order to look up on that information. Okay, so now we found a record. But either you don't speak Spanish or it's really hard to read. Uh, when I first found this record, it took me years because I could not read <laughs> what it said. Not because I don't speak Spanish, but I couldn't read the uh, handwriting. Every priest had a different way of writing, uh, had a different way of um, writing the letters or doing the letters. So sometimes it's very hard to, to really know what they were saying. So um, I have a little bit of a, a word list that I will be showing you so it will be easier. For instance, the um, Spanish alphabet has four extra letters. The first letter that we have is the ñ. For instance, you will find in the records the word niña with the sound ña. And you see it's like an N with a little line on top. 
uh, the next letters are the ch, like Chavez, like my name. In English, we got chair, but we don't. We separate the C and the H. In Spanish, they go together. And the two uh, L's, and those are, for instance, for the word llave. Uh, and then the two R's, for instance, were the word carro. You hear the rolling R's right there. So many of the times you will see those in, in names, last names, uh, places. So we have four extra letters in the alphabet. Um, you also will see um, accent marks on the vowels just to accentuate uh, a syllable. Because uh, if sometimes if you don't put the accent mark, it will mean something different. And sometimes it might be a bad word. <laughs> so it's very important to know what you're saying if you don't have that, that accent mark in there. The word L, the E-L, usually means for masculine. The word la usually means for female. Um, the letters, when it's together with, um, um, the, for instance, the O, the R, and the L is for the masculine, and for feminines, the A, the Eon, the Tat, like Suidad, the Tu, the Ombre. So those are, are a little bit of words to help us to identify the uh, masculine and feminine. Okay, there's a word list um, that we can also purchased from the uh, uh, Mesa Family Search Library. Would we'll explain a little bit of what I just went through more in detail. So I don't want to spend too much time on that because that will be a different class. Uh, but I found this on the uh, Spanish Records track book. There is this book in the uh, Mesa Search Library, and there is the reference number. And it explains a little bit more about um, the abbreviations the, the priests used to do back in the 1700s. You will see a lot of the MMP, meaning abuela materna, or AMP, meaning abuel, abuelo paterno, or abuela paterna. Uh, so this is just a little bit of um, uh, the words that they use there to um, they wouldn't use the whole word to explain something. We'll just use abbreviation, especially for names. So many times it's really hard to know or to know exactly what word they were trying to, to spell. Okay, the same thing here. Now the ones that um, I'm going to be showing you a record in a few minutes. Um, and in that record, we'll, I will show you a little bit of what all these phrases mean. Um, when a person had money back in the 1700s and even in the 1800s, they used to uh, use the word don or doña, right here. Here we use it like a first name, but then that means that somebody was wealthy or somebody who had power. So before their first name, they used to call him doña Maria, don Jose. Uh, nowadays, it's just for uh, to let somebody no more respect. For instance, my in-laws always say Doña Dolores, Don Pablo, meaning that they're older than I am, and I'm just showing a little bit of respect. Okay, same thing here. Uh, you're going to notice, too, in the 1700s, uh, for Jose, they used to use the um, JPH a lot. They don't pronounce the word Joseph, just Jose. Uh, so they use a lot of the uh, PH, and the same thing for Felipa. I'll show you a record where they show that the pH a lot. And for instance, it's not here, but for Jose, sometimes they will just put a J and an E on top. I think they were more lazy than we are right now. <laughs> it's a lot of abbreviations. Um, same thing here. For instance, um, a lot of the names, same thing, two letters, one letter. For the dates, same thing. Okay, so here's a, um, a certificate of a, um, a boy named Francisco. You can see his name here on the top, Francisco. And this is from 1637. So it says right here, 20 that means 26 of February of 1637. It says, I baptize Francisco Mulato. Mulato, and 
hijo de la iglesia, which is mean he was a son of the church. He didn't have no parents. So a lot of people might be looking for um, a relative and find out that that um, sometimes the person didn't have parents. People were just taking the uh, the babies to the church. So they became uh, sons and daughters of the church. And then uh, families will um, will um, raise the children. Okay, the word bonato, that was uh, the classification uh, for the child. Uh, a lot of the priests back then in the 17 and 1800 used a lot of classifications, meaning what type of race the person was. Okay, and once again, hijo de la iglesia, meaning son of the church. Okay, this one is a little bit hard to read. <laughs> and you guys read that? Uh, so it's a lot of scribble there, so it's very hard to um, to read it. Once again, the, the depending on the priest, how he wrote the, uh, uh, okay, for instance, this one here, the word India, she was Indian. Okay, and the parents, as you can see, only says here Francisco and Luisa, Francisco right here and Luisa, there's no last name. They were both um, Indian. And the padrinos, the godfathers, and that's it for that record. So there's not much information for this person. Um, and the date wasn't even specified in this one. And this one, as I was um, covering earlier, um, a lot of the uh, priests use the uh, PH uh, for the names. For instance, this one, the name is Felipe Jose. And you can see it has the PH on Felipe and the uh, PH for Jose there on the side. Now, the beginning of this record, uh, the first three lines, they are in Latin. They're not even in Spanish. So sometimes you might be wondering, what is it that the record is saying? So uh, just basically what they're saying is, where is the priest from and what kind of license he has in order to baptize the person? And this one, um, you can see next to uh, Felipe Jose Pasulo, meaning the classification of the child. But then next to it, it says, he might, he might look like a mulatto. So the priest wasn't sure what kind of uh, classification to give this person. Okay, uh, mostly all the um, the records that you might find have the uh, HL next to it, meaning uh, a legitimate child. Usually they have it on the left and also on inside the record. For instance, this one right here is Jose Francisco, the son of Juan Navarro. And here is, is, is the J and the N. And the AP means um, um, the grandparents on the uh, uh, father's side and the grandparents in the mother's side. And now this one, it will show a little bit more of information than, than the previous ones that we're looking at. So this one has the date very clear on the top. And it will tell you exactly where, it, where the church is located, the year, the priest name. So it has more information than the previous records that we were looking at. And that's what we want, right? <laughs> Obligation, this is for the uh, uh, godparents. So he says that he read the obligations to the uh, godparents for the child that was baptized. Okay, and this is the different types. I only put this one in here. The different types, the way the uh, priest used to write certain letters. For instance, the I, the F. And sometimes the F might look a little bit like um, the L or even like the S, as you can see here. You can see the S right here. It looks a lot like an F. And so um, sometimes you might think it's a different name, but in reality, they're spelling something else. It happens to me with uh, my husband's great-grandmother. Her last name was Hurtado, but I thought it said Delgado, because the way they did the H, it looked like a D. Yes? Question, what, what does HL stand for again? HL means a uh, legitimate son or daughter. So they're asking the question what HL meant. What was the meaning? 
Uh, like I was saying at the beginning, a lot of the records you will see on the left hand side under the name of the person or the child, the uh, uh, classification. And the purpose why the press did this, it was that they wanted to know how many Indians, how many uh, slaves, there also were a lot of slaves in South Mexico, how many Spaniards were in Mexico. So at the beginning, um, the first census that they did um, in the 1600s was to know how many Spaniards were in Mexico. That was the purpose of the census. Okay, and as you can see, this list is a whole list of um, racial um, classifications that the priests use. And there's actually more. I found two more that are not in this list. And they're a little bit confusing, but meaning that they're just, everybody was just getting together. <laughs> And when they mix, uh, they have uh, different names for, for everyone. Um, for instance, there is a family that had twin girls, and each girl had a different classification. One was um, the priest put down a Spaniard, meaning that she was white, and the second girl was classified, uh, the classification was mestiza, the meaning Spanish and Indian, even though they were sisters. And they were twins. So sometimes the priest gave a different classification depending on the color of the skin of the child. Not meaning that they were actually just from from the same same parents. So in colonial Latin America, racial classification was often recorded in in, in the churches records um, just for for their own purposes, not really for uh, the person who was getting baptized, you know. A lot of people nowadays, when they're looking at the records, they're asking, why do I have this in my in my certificate? But that was the purpose, just for the, uh, the government to know how many people were a certain race. So now we have 60% mestizo, that's um, Indian and white, 30% American Indian or Native Indians, 9% white and 1% other. I'm thinking probably the Chinese or the Jews are there in Mexico. There's a lot of Chinese in the uh, city of Mexico in the district. Okay, the first given names, um, something that I found very interesting is that in the uh, 1700, all the girls were named Maria, the first name, and the boys, the first name were given was Jose. Mostly everyone had the same first name. Um, another thing is that um, when they were doing the census, they were not writing the Jose and the Maria, they were just writing their middle names. But they, um, when you see the actual birth record, they had the name Maria or they had the name Jose. The 1800s, late 1800s. Okay, now in the uh, marriage record, you might find. Uh, the groom name, the full name, like um, Jose Antonio and his last name. Um, and sometimes they will specify where he's coming from, or if he was married before. And if he had a, a, a previous wife, it will, they will mention the name of the wife, and they will mention also where she was buried. Uh, if he's single, they will just say that he's single. And the groom usually has the last name of the father. The bride on the uh, marriage um, record, you will find that her name, they will put the name, like for instance here, uh, Maria Chavez, and they will say that she's getting married with the gentleman, and they will put the work on, meaning with, uh, and they will start uh, spe specifically saying, for instance, if her parents are still alive or they're dead. They will specify that on the uh, on the record. Now, the women, when they get married, they don't carry uh, the husband's last name like we do here in the States. Usually, uh, she will continue having her own last name, meaning she will continue having her father's last name. Um, and that's just the way that it is in Mexico and also, um, uh, persons in Mexico, they carry the uh, father and the mother's last name, so they carry both last names. Okay, what else can we find at the uh, Mexic 
at the Family Search Library, we can find books, films, and maps that can also help us with our research. Um, this is some of the books that I, I, I found when I was doing the research, but there is tons and tons of books uh, at the uh, um, Mesa Family Research that can help us find a little bit more information. Also, there's this one. Um, Ten years ago, before a lot of the information was uh, put on online, um, there is a book of um, where they have all the states, names of the states. And as you can see here, they will have, for instance, uh, uh, the state here, the city, then the year where the record is, and they will give uh, the project, either if the, the film has been um, put like in a group, and here is the, uh, the number of the film. So a lot of times um, when somebody is looking for a relative in a certain year, they can go in there and look at the film and order the film. Okay, for instance, um, I got several films um, at the library that I used to look on. And every film might have a different uh, region. For instance, it might be baptisms, birthdays, marriage. And it will specify to the place. Sometimes, like the ones from Jalisco, will not specify the, the city. It will just say Jalisco. But for instance, the ones in Aguascalientes will tell you if exactly the region um, where you're looking at uh, the record. And this is other places that I have used in the past to find um, more information. Uh, Nuestros Ranchos, I like that one. Uh, that one is only specific for the states of Jalisco, Zacatecas, and Aguascalientes. Um, the people who are using this, um, this site, um, they have a very long, long, long research. So I've been able to connect with a lot of people there and finding a lot of my husband's ancestors there, too. Same thing for Somos Primos, meaning we're cousins. Uh, a lot of the people there are contributing the information to one another. Um, in a lot of these sites, there are not LDS sites, but there are people who are just doing genealogy for their own good, and they just want to find more information about their ancestors. Um, another one that I like is all about Mexico. You want to find a little bit more about the history, um, you can go to that site. Now, Google is another way, another way of finding more information. It's one of my favorite tools when I'm looking or searching for a certain place in Mexico. I just Google the place or even Google the last name, and it will give you certain pictures or certain information about the place that you're looking for. And there is uh, the Bracero Archive. Um, if you want to find more about the uh, Braceros, uh, they have a little list of the men that came. For more information, there's a film, too, um, about the Braceros. And of course, the uh, Ancestry.com at the uh, Mesa Search Library, which is free up there, um, can give us more information in, in finding more of uh, our ancestors in, in Mexico. OK, a lot of people usually um, that I've been working with, once they find this information, they say, okay, what do I do with it? Um, we need to organize the information. Um, my favorite one so far is the research log, because sometimes I went and, oh, you have a question? Yes. Um, the question is, uh, how would I find records for families in the Mormon colony? Oh, good question. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> so they're asking, um, how can I find more information of the uh, um, the families in the uh, Mormon colonies. So uh, there's another way just to, to Google it. That's how I found the information there. Or uh, come to the family uh, search library, and we can help you find more information in that. But once you find the information, it's very important to write down exactly where you're getting it from. Because sometimes you might find someone, and you go back two, three years later, and you're searching for the same person again because you forgot to write where you got that information. So that happened to me. I went over and over looking for the same person several times because I forgot where I got that information. So 
it's very important to write down where you're getting this information. Um, then do a pedigree chart. And all these um, sheets, you can get them at the, uh, at the uh, VESA Library Search uh, website. There's forms there where you can get them, too. And this is the end. Um, I just wanted to say Mexico is a, a beautiful place. I, I was there. Close to going to the pyramids, but we got there one minute late. They closed us, so we were not able to go in. But um, I don't know if anybody has questions. This is in the uh, city of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you.